Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight for the European Disaster Plasticity Webinar. I hope everyone is safe and comfortable this evening. This evening on the panel, we have uh, a good faculty from all over Europe. We have Dr. Balestro from Bourges in France. We have Dr. Tauber from Munich in Germany, and uh, Mr. Kent from Liverpool in the UK. Before we get started, um, I just wanted to let you know that we encourage you to please ask questions. On the right hand of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. Feel free to ask your questions tonight in French, in Spanish, or in English. We have uh, my two colleagues, Bernabe Ramirez and Eric Astoin with us tonight, and they can answer your questions in all those languages tonight. So on tonight's menu, we have various difficult cases that the, um, the faculty wanted to share with you. Um, of course, because they are interesting, but mostly because it taught them something and they wanted to share that experience with you tonight. So without further ado, I think Mr. Kent, you will be the first one to um, give us the appetizer featuring an infection and massive bone loss case. Mr. Kent, the stage is yours. Oh, thank you. Um, well, thank you, Exactec, for inviting me. It's, it's, it's an honour. Um, shame it can't be in person. I did get dressed up for the occasion because I um, can't really do that anymore in the UK. We're sort of stuck indoors and even at work, I have to wear scrubs all the time now. So, uh, so it's a good excuse to get uh, dressed up. But anyway, on with the, the case, and I hope it's a good one to start. So um, would you like to move the slide on? Yeah. So... This was a 70 year old patient. She started outside of our care and um, she's rheumatoid. You can question what they did a number of years ago, but that's not what this is about. So, you know, she had a resurfacing with a rotator cuff repair back in 2008, and then went on after the cuff failed to have a, a hemiarthroplasty with a CTA head. They were then concerned about infection six years later, um, due to some swelling around the, the, the uh, shoulder and she had an arthroscopic washout but there was no growth at that point in time. So if we just move on, she, uh, she was then referred on to us um, mainly because she wasn't doing very well so she had night pain, function was poor but I suspect it had been poor all along really um, but they just get on with it as a, as a rheumatoid patient. And she had erythema over the wound, which is perhaps the most concerning feature. Um, so at this stage, we were sort of stuck with a patient with likely infection. Uh, when we'd scanned it, there was really quite significant erosion of the glenoid. Um, and we had this sort of well-fixed cemented stem and really thin rheumatoid um, cortical bone. Now, I didn't feel comfortable doing a single stage procedure for her. We had no organism. And um, uh, I suppose here's where some of what I think were potential errors were made on, on my part. So first of all, um, trying to remove the stem. Um, I'm trying to, you can go back it, just trying to unpick the, um, unpick the cement around the top. We lost the tuberosities. And um, subsequent to that, because the, 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 uh, we were failing uh, to get the cement and the stem out, we did an osteotomy. And actually we got that back and it looked pretty good on the initial x-rays, but the disaster happened about three weeks later when she had sudden pain and we ended up with a fracture that you can see on the right-hand side of the screen. I put the left-hand picture up because this is how I sort of adapted the cement spaces in subsequent cases when we've got bone loss in that area or form an osteotomy to cover that area using these wires, which are guide wires from a, um, a nailing set and uh, an extension is created on a tube of a cement gun so that it, we effectively get a longer cement spacer that can bridge that gap and prevent that stress rise that I think caused the fracture in, in her. So we're, ne we're now stuck. Uh, next slide, with um, uh, really troublesome glenoid, um, significant retroversion, about 30 degrees, superiorly inclined by um, about uh, 10 degrees. We've got infection. She did grow an organism. It was a strange organism. I, I forget what it was now, but she was treated for that. We've got no tuberosities, we've got poor bone, and we've got this mobile mid-shaft fracture. So, so what next? And 
We did think about using a, a standard long stemmed um, arthroplasty for this, but my feeling was that that would um, that fracture would never heal and there'd be huge stress fries on a really long lever arm to that. So we decided to do a proximal humeral replacement. I put the initial slide up on the left there, really just to demonstrate that when you're doing this sort of surgery, the neurovascular stuff is really close. That's actually a tumor, metastatic tumor case. Um, so it started off with, with um, uh, more normal tissue, I suppose, normal-ish. Um, but you can see all the neurovascular structures. For her, I wanted to keep the bone. I wanted to keep the uh, muscle attachments that we had in as normal a place as possible. So we re the, um the, the proximal humerus and sort of tried to fit it around this uh, HRP. Didn't use any bone graft for the glenoid. Um, we uh, used a superior augmented navigated um, glenoid, which took us down to about four degrees inferior tilt and accepted about 14 degrees of retroversion in her. The next slide. Um, so but these are these were the post-op x-rays and, and actually functionally she, she, she's done quite well you know i mean she's not in too much pain her scores on both oxford shoulder and dash improved i can't say she's got fantastic movements um but i think when we reflected on the x-rays i'm not convinced we really got enough lateralization um on her you can see on that picture on the far right there that there's a little bit of sort of detensioning of the deltoid, which comes with patients who have a resection below the level of deltoid, but it's not really lateralized significantly beyond the, the, the acromion. Um, and I think that potentially affected her ability to, to, to move and elevate her arm despite her reasonable scores. And I suspect that's just because she's a coping rheumatoid patient more than anything. Um, so that was the, the first case. Um, you know, on reflection, I think I would have progressed to an osteotomy earlier rather than trying to get the stem out with that terrible bone that she had. I didn't feel comfortable using a graft in the um, presence of recent infection. I think we should have lateralized her better and um, probably could have achieved that with a, with a lateralized glenosphere. Um, and there are always issues relating to function whenever you reset below deltoid. I mean, it's, it's an immediate thing that increases your complication rates and increases or rather decreases the functionality of that arm for, for the patient. So it's something we really try to avoid if possible, but clearly sometimes it's impossible. So that's my first case. So, um, I mean, I think we, we, we want to put this out to discussion. If anybody's got any questions, please um, write those in and, and we'll try and answer them. But first to, to, to JC, really, I mean, that started off as a, as, a, as a sort of more normal looking bone on the humerus. And, and I think I progressed that to be something more. Um, any tips or advice on how we could have prevented that? What you done anything differently at the beginning? I think it will be very difficult with her. I mean, the, the bone quality was really bad. And uh, when you have to remove all this cement, then you, you know that uh, the risk is to have fracture of uh, the diaphysis of the humerus. The question is, yes, probably we, you could, but it's easy to say, not easy to do during the case, but you could have performed immediately a humeral osteotomy to remove the, the cement uh, more easily. And Hopefully, or luckily, I don't know, as you want, trying to avoid this kind of fracture. But then, uh, once you have this fracture, what was your option, really? I guess you had two options, the HRP that you have performed, and I guess that was a good solution because this is, it fixed everything in one surgery, normally. And the other would have been to use a massive allograft around the native bone and fix everything waiting for it to heal, and then perform a reverse. But it means two surgeries on a rheumatoid patient and with a very high risk of infection. So that's a very, very tough case. Matthew?
Huh? You hear me? Yes, I can hear you, JC. Because uh, I'm not sure if Matthew is with us. Yeah, yeah. I think Matthew is frozen. Yeah. So what I can I can make my comment on this case is it's really challenging. Uh, I have to admit. So I wouldn't have done uh, HRP. I think this is a quite, it's a good solution, but it's a quite aggressive solution. I probably wouldn't have maybe all that cement, but have done a, a long stem reverse uh, with cementing in cement, which is also a good option. Um, but anyway, you have still the, the problem of the glenoid. Um, I would have used a lateralized glenosphere because this is important uh, to improve the stability. Um, but it's always in remitute uh, patients, the problem of the poor qual bone quality. And uh, I agree with you, a bone strut would have been another option to reinforce the proximal humerus. And there was this problem of, of the potential infection with this patient and I probably believe why uh, Matthew avoid the bone graft, I guess. But, uh, Matthew, you're back. Yeah, sorry. My wife put the microwave on downstairs. It just wrecked everything. So uh, I told her off appropriately. Okay. <laughs> yes, the bone graft. I, I think in the presence of infection, I'm very fearful of bone graft. And um, I, I know the HIT guys, they stopped using that because uh, of the infection rates were, were, were too high. So I think, you know, we learn a lot from the hip um, and knee revision people. And so um, I think we need to take note of what they, their experience, because it's beyond ours in shoulder revision, I think. And uh, maybe Matthew, can you, can you explain us your, the way uh, you have uh, out your case on the, the, the glenoid implant, the base plate that you have used, you have used the 10 degrees superior implant, but you could maybe also have used the eight degrees. Why did you choose the 10 degrees instead of the eight? Probably for stability, no? In, you mean instead of the posterior one? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so I think in this particular case, the posterior superior augment would have been the best, but we don't have that in Europe. Um, uh, I, because I feel that um, the most important thing is to not be superiorly tilted, because I think that that leads to, you know, the biomechanics of that are terrible, and it just leads to failure of the glenoid. So the, the failures that we've had very few failures of the glenoid, actually, um, with this, in, with the exact implant, and the ones we have had, I think, have been put in a little bit of superior inclination. And what I would add is that it's surprising um, even on a relatively normal glenoid, when you template them, I often end up using an augment because on what appears normal, according to the Friedman's axis that they put on for you, it's superiorly tilted. So I don't think there's any harm in putting a superior one on and pointing it downwards. I'd rather, I'd rather do that for, for a lot of cases. I don't know if you feel the same. Do you do that? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think we could have I could have lateralized that in a couple of ways. So what one would have been to have put a, a lateralized glenosphere, and the other one would be a bigger body. She had an extra small body. But I suppose the question would be how how do you assess that lateralization? I mean, on the table because you can't do it so, so well in the planning. You know, you're you're when you're when you're using that HRP mark. Do, how do you assess? with the body, what size to use and how lateral it feels. Do you have any tips for that? Am I not coming through? No, you are. We actually oh. have a from the audience that is similar to this. And they were wondering how um, happy you were with the deltoid wrapping post-op and if uh, looking back you might have chosen a different proximal body to try to enhance that uh, that wrapping or not yeah I, I absolutely think so I, I think that we didn't get enough deltoid wrap on there I mean as it happens she's okay but I think you, if you're going to be critical and review that case then yeah I think we didn't have enough deltoid wrap on it but it's difficult to assess because in the in the surgery you know, we felt she was stable. We felt that the deltoid was wrapping around that nicely. She's a tiny lady. You know, you don't, you do see, particularly with other design of implants, that um, 
you get this real sort of altered contour of the shoulder, a real lateralization that, that, that sort of looks ugly. I, I think the way this implant's designed that sort of fills things rather than it's just a thin um, shape is a lot better, but perhaps I've got, I've got to learn, you know, how that feels in real life because um, it's different to the other manufacturers' designs. I mean, as an advantage, I feel, because it fills the space better. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I think we can move on to the second case. JC, you have a nice bilateral shoulder case, uh, shoulder pain case for us. Yeah. So I thank Exactly Two for inviting me to uh, this session. So this is a 73 years old female uh, who suffered with rheumatoid arthritis and depression for a very long time. Next slide, please. And uh, on the right shoulder, she was pretty painful, seven out of 10, and the function was really bad, 60 degrees of active elevation and 10 degrees of external rotation, elbow at the side. On the X-ray, next slide, please. So on the right side, she had a massive bone loss on the, on the glenoid side and a huge cyst on the humeral head. Next, please. On the MRI, the cuff was not bad, but we clearly see the medialization of the joint line and the cyst that she had on the humeral head, which does not look like too bad there, but on the CT scan on the right part of the screen, you see that the humeral head was not fit for grafting. And we see this huge retroversion and medialization of the, of the joint line. Next, please. So here is uh, the um, 3D imaging on the, on the planific planification software of Exactech. So she had 28 degrees of retroversion, medialization of the joint line, as you can see here. I mean, uh, this woman should have had surgery a long time ago. Next, please. Uh, so on the left part of the screen, you can choose the implant that you want. So obviously we will perform a reverse. So you can choose uh, between a standard plate, an eight degree posterior augment, and that, that is what we have used here. See the difference between the standard plate, base plate and uh, an eight degrees augment. Then you can uh, play with the way you want to um, position your base plate. You can play with the retroversion, with the antiversion, with the inclination, and with the depth, as you can see there. And also on the right part of the screen, you can check what is your bone to implant percent of percentage of contact. So we uh, usually want more than 75 degree uh, percent of uh, bone to implant contact. Uh, to have a, a good biomechanical results. And here is what I have done. I'm not sure I would do the same thing right now, and we can discuss about that later. So I have used an eight degree posterior augment. I didn't perform any bone graft. We will speak about that later. The subscapularis was not uh, repairable because it was too tight. So that was for the, for the right side. And see, I have used an augmented tray. So we can go back to the previous slide, please. I have used a augmented tray because she was a bit loose with a standard tray. Okay, next slide, please. On the left shoulder, she was also very painful. The function was a bit better. Uh, next. The X-ray demonstrated a nephritis. Uh, and look at the CT scan. So the retroversion was 17 degrees on the CT scan, but we will see it's different on the planification software. The cuff was the cuff muscle was were okay. Okay, next. So here is the, the software, and you can see that on the CT we had 70 degrees of retroversion, but we have 28 degrees of retroversion on the, on the software. So it's pretty different between the CT, right? Uh, and definitely, when you look at that, there's no 17 degrees of retroversion. There is more than 20. Okay, next. Uh, and so we have uh, planned an eight degree posterior augment uh, with seven degrees of retroversion, no inclination. Okay, next. So here is the post op x rays. 
we have been able to, uh, to repair the subs cap at the end of the procedure. It was not too tight. This is the eight degree posterior augment on the glenoid. Okay. Next, please. Okay. Here have, we have the results. The active elevation is good on both sides. I mean, it's acceptable. Uh, the external rotation is better on the right hand side. So the right hand side was the very warm one. Uh, the external rotation is better on the right hand side because we didn't repair the subs cap. And on the, but look how the internal rotation is really limited because of the medialization of the, of the joint line. As on the left hand side, it's pretty good. So, so far, the patient is happy, she's pain free, and uh, she uh, suffered a lot of pain due to her disease. So, now we can discuss about what we could do. Uh, Matthew, uh, would you have done anything differently on the right or on the left hand side? Matthew, Matthew. Sorry, sorry, classic right. error. Um, yeah, I, um, I I think I would have, JC. I I think um, I mean I think I would have bone grafted it with that level of uh, you know absence of infection and um, that level of retroversion. I would have. Um, definitely consider bone grafting. I mean, I totally agree with you that her humeral head wasn't really appropriate, and that is very definitely the easiest thing to do, and in some ways the most satisfying thing to do. Um, so you'd be stuck with making a decision between allograft or aliac crest, and, um, and my personal preference is for allograft, but um, I, I, and I'll show you a case of that later, but. Um, but but I don't see any reason why you couldn't use iliac crest. It's just the morbidity that comes with the iliac crest that's the that's the problem more than anything. Um, but yeah, that's what I think I would have done, and it would have achieved your lateralization. Um, and I think you'd have still got a, you know she's got reasonable bone left on the glenoid, so you would have had good fixation on the glenoid. Um, so yeah, long caged, um, long long cage on a on, on it and the bone graft. Yeah. Mark? Yeah, I agree with Matthew. I, in the right shoulder, I wouldn't have done a bone grafting with a long back base plate. I think it's maybe better to, to restore the retroversion. Um, on the left side, I'm completely with you. The, the functional result is great and it couldn't be better. I definitely agree with you. Uh, I performed this case like two, two years ago. And it was, uh, I didn't have a lot of experience with a rheumatoid patient. I was worried about glenoid loosening. Um, I was worried about too much shear forces on the glenoid side. Uh, and she didn't want uh, an iliac crest harvesting. And I was very worried with an allograft. So we decided to do that. But I think that right now, I would definitely use a uh, femoral head allograft. And you will see, you will show us how to do that in one of your next case. And that's pretty interesting. OK. Um, yeah. Um, do you think that the loss of internal rotation is purely down to the fact it's medialized? Because I sometimes see, particularly in smaller females, um, that as you internally rotate, because it has to roll around the glenosphere rather than spinning on the spot, that it actually can um, impinge upon the conjoint tendon and you lose internal rotation because you get this impingement effect on the, on the, on the conjoint. Now, I appreciate you didn't get that on the other side, so it may well be you're correct, but I think that that is one of the factors in why people don't get such good internal rotation with a with a lateralized reverse. But you know, with a medialized stem when you are a registrar, you see this patient uh, after the surgery with a medialized stem and not so good internal rotation, and then you follow them and you see this notching appearing. And while this notching appears, then the internal rotation increases. Mm. Have you seen that? Yeah. So that, that's what I think that the medial, medialized stem uh, decreases the internal rotation compared to a, to a lateralized one. Uh, and definitely, yes, if you use um, like a 42 uh, glen sphere instead of a 38, then you can have an impeachment with the conjoint tendon, which can decrease also your internal rotation. Yeah. Okay. 
definitely. That's why I always use 38 uh, on the first basis, most of the time. But in this regards, we have to um, think also about the, the retroversion of the of the implant, of the humeral implant, because uh, I suppose our standard retroversion is 20 degrees, right? On the, hum yeah. on the humeral side? Yeah, no, I say from the humor, the humor uh, component, we give it the 20 degrees of retroversion. What I do is if I'm not, uh, I'm not able to, to refix the subscap, I give them less than um, minus 20. So I go to minus 10 or maybe also zero. And so they have more internal rotation uh, post-op. So we have to think always about that. Yeah, this is a, this is a good trick. And it's easy. We have a question from the audience. Uh, they are wondering how you dealt with the bone defect, the cyst that we see in the glenoid. Did you do anything special on it? Yeah, on, the, on, the, on the left hand side, on the left hand side, I think when I when I have rimmed the, the glenoid, I didn't reach the cyst, so I didn't touch the cyst, I didn't graft it. But uh, if during the rimming the cyst appeared, I would have grafted it with the bone of the humeral head. That's the easiest way to do. Another question that's that's uh, related to how you treat the rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you cemented the stem. No, Would you? I didn't. No. No. Okay. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, if you, I mean, it's not mandatory to cement the stem on the rheumatoid arthritis patient. Not at all. Okay. Thank you. If you if you are if your fit is good, I don't think we have to cement. Removal of the cement is always a pain. Like. Like remember the previous case of Matthew, removing cement is a pain and it's dangerous. So if I can avoid cement, I avoid cement. Yeah. Okay. But it's also fair to say that in a rheumatoid patient, if you have really terrible bone, you know, you have no metaphyseal, because sometimes it's literally just like liquid fat in the metaphysis, then you're gonna cement it, right? You know. If you don't have the choice, yes, sure. Yeah. 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 And I think All from right. the cyst perspective, you know that. Because we're aiming, or at least I did, you're not aiming to go through the subcortical bone. You don't really get to the cyst. So I would largely ignore those cysts um, unless they frankly appeared in front of you, you know, like you say. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Moving on. I think we have a case that uh, justifies the uh, scapula bone graft that Mark is going to tell us about. Yeah. Good evening to everybody. Thank you to Exactech for inviting me to this uh, great webinar. And my case, yeah, we are talking about bone grafting on the Glenwood site. Um, this was a 69 year old uh, man. He was operated in 2010 with a reverse for cafe arthropathy. And post-operatively, he developed an incomplete axillary nerve palsy, which was um, also evaluated neurologically, and he had a morbus Parkinson. At the beginning, he was quite fine. He reported to me, he had, uh, when he came to me, a good range, a moderate range of motion, I would say, with an antiversion of 90 degrees, a deduction of 90 degrees, external rotation of 10 degrees, and an internal rotation to the fifth lumbar vertebra. But his problem after that time, so after seven years, he had pain. He had continuous pain and subjective sensation of instability. So next slide, please. Um, and due to that um, yeah, severe pain, uh, we decided to go for revision. And this was um, the intraoperative finding on the glenoid. He had the glenoid notching. Um, even if in the most cases, glenoid notching um, is asymptomatic, I be believed in that case that it was the reason for pain. Uh, of course, we took some samples of soft tissue probes uh, for microbiology, he had no infection. And the plan was to um, do, do bone grafting on the inferior glenoid neck um, and to implant a bigger glenosphere to improve stability. So I use, this is my preference, um, allograft, usually from the femoral head. 
and I used the same system which was already inside. It was a DEPU system. I wanted, of course, to avoid removal of the humeral component. And you see here in the right uh, picture, the, the bone graft was fixed with the inferior screw. Next slide, please. And on the right side, you see the post of X-ray. Um, we achieved good distalization, so much more than a pre-operative. I used a long tech to, to fix the new base plate uh, into the native glenoid. And you see with the inferior screw, I fixed the bone graft um, to, the, to, the, to the scapula. And I used um, a bigger glenosphere, uh, 42, in order to increase stability as well. A lateralized glenosphere is not available with this system, which I would have pre preferred. So basically I was happy. And then next slide, please. You see here, already after one month, the reverse dislocated again. There was no trauma, it was atraumatic. It was reduced um, under general anesthesia. And then the patient was quite fine. He was doing well with some physiotherapy for a couple of months. And then he came back uh, one year later. So next slide, please. And he had redislocation again. And um, he persisted to, or he insisted to do a revision surgery as well. And on the, on the graphs below, you see the, the biomechanical problem with such a system where you have an inclination of 155 degrees in the middleized system. So your deltoid muscle is pulling your, your head in a superior direction and in a lateral direction. So when we have to go for revision, we have to, to go for lateralization. And lateralization, you have two possibilities. You can do bone grafting in terms of a bio-RSR or you can use metal, so a lateralizing glenosphere. Always think about infection, but patient had bad pain. And um, the plan was to do it in a one-stage revision, always thinking about a low-grade infection. So next slide. Here again, this is my, my preference. I use a femoral head allograft, which is shaped according to the remnant uh, glenoid anatomy. You see here the base plate with the long pack. I always try at least to insert 50% of the, of the pack into the native glenoid, which was possible, good possible in this, in this case. You see in the right picture uh, below that is at least 50% of the, of the pack inside the native glenoid. The next slide, please. This is the intraoperative situs. So I use the glenosphere 42 and lateralized and intraoperatively, it still was not really stable. So I use the constraint inlay as well. As well. So next slide. And this is the intraoperative test of stability. We have a good passive range of motion and a stable, a stable situation. So next slide. And here you see the comparison between the pre-op and the post-op X-ray. We have a quite extended lateralization of the whole system with a good deltoid wrapping. So again, we did bone grafting in terms of a bio-RSR. We used the lateralized glenosphere. And in contrast to the DEPU system, we use the exact them, which is lateralizing as well. And so we achieved a good deltoid wrapping and of course, increased stability of the system. So next slide. So as a take home, match, home message of this, of this case, biomechanically lateralization is important to uh, increase the deltoid force vectors in terms of stability. The, think about the deltoid wrapping, which is a very important principle. Uh, in this case, bone grafting was necessary because we had bone loss on the glenoid side. If you do revision arthroplasty 
always think about infection. There can always be some low-grade infection inside. Take your uh, probes and samples for microbiology. It's a very important aspect. And then, of course, in this patient, we had the comorbidities as important risk factors. We had the incomplete axillary nerve palsy and the morbus Parkinson. So now we can discuss the case. Um, you see, I used all possibilities for lateralization. So bone grafting, a lateralized venous sphere, a lateralized humerus stem design. Um, it was it was necessary in this case because the deltoid muscle was not that uh, tight as we are used to have it. And um, yeah, these are borderline cases, very challenging. But I think at the end of the day, we got a stable situation, was, which was the aim of this procedure. And uh, now, would you perform your first revision uh, any differently? <laughs> Yeah, of course, after second revision, you always would do it different. You know, if you do revision surgery, you always have respect to remove the, the stem, which is quite stable and good implanted. And I, my, or my idea was that maybe dealing only with the, with the glenoid notching and to use a bigger glenosphere, we would, would have success, which was unfortunately not the case. But Mark, I mean, I, I think you're, uh, I think you're being a little bit unfair on yourself uh, in the in the sense that, that that first revision actually looked excellent, and um, I I think that and it was stable for a period, wasn't it? And I think that in, you know, the vast majority of cases, your reasoning, i.e., keeping the stem um, and what you did would have would have worked, and it probably is the fact that the, the deltoid wasn't functional um, yeah. because of the previous nerve palsy that, that tipped it over the edge and outside of your favor. Um, but I think if, if, you know, realistically, if you came back to that case again and it happened to be in a patient with a normal deltoid, would you take the stem out and everything or would you do what you did that first revision? Because I think I would, I, I couldn't really criticize what you did the first time. I think it was good. Yeah. No, probably not. Probably I wouldn't have been done the same the same procedure again. The, the problem in this system with the de de depu system with the delta is that they don't have lateralized menospheres. Yeah. So this is this is a, a big limitation, and um, yeah, if this would be available, it would be very helpful. Yeah, it's great, and and I would just. Um re-emphasize your comment about the peg length um, and so we use the long peg and you saying that you have half that uh, peg exposed and into the native bone and that's that's really important and um, uh, and fits with other data that's out there um, about peg to designs that, that you need just under a centimeter and that that is effectively half that long peg so um, so we shouldn't be putting graphs bigger than that right yeah, yeah. Usually you feel how stable it is, and um, when you g gain good press fit uh, stability, then it's always a, a, a good sign. Then I have a good feeling, and fifty percent, I think it's 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 necessary. Yeah, and um, we discussed before, I think, about um, so perf you didn't perforate the vaults there with that peg, and I. Um, I personally don't have any issue with perforating the vaults. I, I don't find it a problem. But you're you're going to uh, you're going to scare everybody now when you you say why you don't do that, right? Yeah, yeah I did a revision a couple of months ago where um, a colleague of mine perforated the vault and he created a scapula fracture, which was. Uh, really extending to the whole body and into the scapula spine, and there was a non-union with loosening of the base plate after a couple of months it was very painful. And then you have a big problem because you have a non-united scapular fracture. You have to revise the, 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 the glenoid component. This was really big, a big problem. And uh, therefore, since that case, I'm, I'm very, very careful to perforating the vault. 
On, on, incidentally, on my first case, because of the level of retroversion, the bolt was perforated anteriorly, um, and we didn't have that complication, so it doesn't happen all the time, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> of course, it depends where you where you where you perforate the bolt. If you perforate it yeah. anteriorly or posteriorly, it's fine. But if you perforate it directly down in the middle towards mm -hmm. the scapula blade, then you can then you can create the, the fracture. And in that case, it was, and it's yeah, it's a very Unhappy, unhappy case mm. with big problems for the patient. Yeah, I've never seen a fracture because uh, a perforation of the vault never ever. I mean, uh, maybe maybe if the perforation was not uh, deep enough, see, when you when you uh, during the insertion of the of the long peg, if you uh, see what I mean, then maybe, but it uh, I've never seen that. Yeah. I have seen one, but one was very was very sad. <laughs> Scary enough. Mark, we have a question from the audience. During yes. the second vision, did you see that? Did you find that the first graft that you put in had healed? And yes. if yes, did you remove the screw when you when you did the second revision? Yeah, yeah. The the the, the graft was was healed very well. And uh, this is also my experience. I had some uh, revisions. Allografting is doing a good job. And I, I prefer Allograft. It's available. It's very easy to, to get it. It's, it's, it's cheap. Um, and it, it was integrated. Excellent. All right. Thank you very much. We are almost on time. So we can move on to the next case. So going back to Mr. Kent, who will show us a case revision following infection. Yeah, and 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 following on from the from the bone grafting, really. So um, yeah, so let's make a start going with the first one. So so this is a, a you know a challenge from the beginning, really. Um, young guy, taxi driver, previous rugby, so he's an active chap. He'd unfortunately dislocated both his shoulders playing rugby, and as a consequence, had um, uh, arthropathy on both sides. Um, the side that we're talking about, the left side, he had had an osteopathic debridement as an attempt to manage this, but it failed. Um, and he ultimately, again, not under my care, but had a, a hemiarthroplasty in 2012. Hemiarthroplasty mainly because of his age, I think, was the the um, the reasoning behind that. Now he he did okay, and I think as you know you would expect for hemiarthroplasty. So he he managed to get to the gym doing some exercise. He had some pain, but it was better. His movement wasn't brilliant, but then um, to everyone's surprise, appeared at one year with uh, a discharging sinus. However, the X-rays did not suggest any uh, chronic infection or loosening uh, associated with his implant. So uh, next slide. So um, unfortunately, I don't have his original um, films, but uh, again, uh, it was my preference to do a two-stage revision for him. Um, so these are his immediate post-op imaging. I always put a cuff of cement around the top of the um, sort of late setting cement around the top of the, of the spacer so that it's, it is stable uh, in the humerus, I don't want it wobbling around. And um, as it happened, uh, he grew piatnit in every single sample. But the oddity was, or not really an oddity, but the interesting point is that his pain was actually better with the cement spacer than it was with his original hemiarthroplasty. And in fact, if you go onto the next slide, he, he, his, um, his movement also was a lot better. So he, he achieved with the cement spacer elevation of over 100, 150 degrees it was incredible and perhaps unsurprisingly he then decided well actually I'm working as a taxi driver I'm not in that much pain my arm works for day-to-day -day life I don't want any more surgery at that point in time so he he stayed with his cement spacer um, and just next slide so uh, you missed, missed one. So, so what happened as a consequence of that was that he had degradation of his glenoid and he had degradation of his um, cement spacer. So they sort of both eroded if you look at those x-rays, but that's over a period of about four years. And then he, he started to get pain again. So he made a decision at that point that he wanted revision surgery. Um, so we CT'd him at that stage. He had this really 
uh, retroverted, glenoid, um, he had, but also a lot of centralized um, and superior wear as well that you're not, not seeing completely on there. So um, the plan based on that, and when we looked at it on the um, planning was that I didn't feel we could really uh, use his own glenoid without lateralizing this. Um, it was going to take too much of his native bone away to get um, an implant to sit adequately. So the decision was to perform bone grafting. Now I've said before to you that I am fearful of doing bone grafting in a patient with previous infection. And I still stand by that, but the decision in this guy was that he'd been four years without any evidence of infection. So actually I felt that he was, it was safe, you know, um, to proceed with bone grafting. So uh, if we just go to the next slide. So what, what I wanted to point out here is, is just how we do it. So um, using the um, planning app to determine the size of your bone graft. So what you see on the uh, left side there is that, um, so this, this is aligned with the sort of bottom two holes of the of the implant and we've spun the scapula around i've put that in by three millimeters because i want a circumferential graft so we're going to read three millimeters off the top and then each depth marker is one millimeter so i can figure out for each hole how much i need what depth of graft i need for that graft to sit onto the native bone so when you've worked that out for every hole you can go on to the next slide you can actually get a picture then of, of how much depth of bone graft you require next to each hole to fit his native glenoid. Um, and then we're using allograft. I mean, we had to obviously in him because his, his humeral head's gone. So next slide. Um, so what we do is, is effectively ream the top of the head like we were reaming the glenoid. So the back of the base plate will fit on it. We put the uh, drill hole into it. Um, now you just got to be careful because it's eccentric. So left and right is important in that. Um, and then next slide. And then once we've done that, we can measure out um, exactly how much we need. Um, and I would just oversize it a little bit because the saw will take more than you, than you, than you want. Um, but effectively you can just modify and shape that to, to where your measurements um, sat. And um, early days next slide we were we were also 3d printing um but we don't bother with that anymore because we're happy that the that this works uh, and then impact that graft and as mark said you know this once you impact that it's actually really stable and all of a sudden the glenoid is pointing straight towards you rather than in some uh, direction away from you and everything suddenly gets a lot easier um so next slide so this was his post-op x-rays very satisfactory Unfortunately, he grew piacnes in every single sample again, which was a bit of a nightmare. He had his two months of antibiotics, but we grafted him in answer to somebody's question earlier. Um, this the next slide, the CT um, showed complete integration of that at eight months, despite the infection. Um, I mean, we've never had any issue, further issue with infection in him in the last year and a half. Um, so I'm assuming that that has been treated adequately now again. But, um, and he had brilliant function, you know, um, uh, good scores and good elevation and he's really happy and he now wants me to operate on the other side. So start again from the other side. Um, yeah, so that's it. And um, so discussion, I mean, I suppose, um, would anybody have done anything differently in him, Mark? Would you have done anything differently? No, I don't think so. Your, your, results, your results are very convincing. He had, after the revision, the best function ever. So I, I think that you did everything right. And would you have considered a, sing, you know, at the very beginning of all that, um, would you have considered a first stage, a single stage revision? Is, what's people's concept of single stage revisions? I mean. No, I avoid, I avoid single stage revision if they have a sinus. Mm -hmm. um, this is for me a contraindication, and then I go for two-stage revision. I wouldn't have the same. I would have done the same as you. Even though you know the um, John. If, if you know, if you know the bacteria responsible for the infection, then you will still go for two-stage. 
So that would, I mean, I, I'm a big advocate of two stage and I think maybe too much. I've seen it when I've been out in the States, they, they're much more single stage. Um, I think if, if, if you had a very sensitive organism, I, I'd be a little bit compelled towards that. Um, but if you had something that you know is a disaster like E. coli or mixed growth, you know, I, I, I absolutely would not. And, and do you think um, it would have been useful to uh, remove the spacer and take samples for bacteriological analysis, don't put anything, waiting for the results. And if uh, P. acnes grew again, then wash again, re-antibiotics, not to, I don't know, not to think, I think I would have done that. Yeah, well, I mean, there's a there's a, been a paper recently about that, hasn't there? And um, yeah, I mean, there's so there are a few centers that do that interim additional surgery to prove that, that it's infection free as an open biopsy. I mean, there are always pluses and minuses, aren't there? In the sense that I get why and, and maybe it's the right thing to do, but at the same time, you're exposing the patient to an additional procedure. And, and if you're going to then wash out again and then check again, it's actually an additional three procedures. You know, where do you stop at that point in time? It's, um, yeah, I think it's, it's difficult. And maybe, again, that should depend on the severity of infection and the organism that you're dealing with rather than every case, perhaps, I think, personally. It's certainly something I've considered and, 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 bring, and to bring into our practice in Liverpool, it's something I've certainly considered, yeah. So some people are asking questions. About yeah, we're getting how, a lot of questions about the, yeah. the bone grafting. Uh, one of them is about how far can you go in trying to reconstruct the bone? Um, the second one is, have you ever considered doing a intermediate surgery where you only graft and then let it heal for a little bit before you do the final surgery? I think you, you touched on that question um, with the infection cleaning. But uh, is the answer the same uh, when it comes to bone no. grafting? So with bone grafting, so Mark, Mark's point and what I reiterated on the last case is the most relevant point, I think. It, it's your, your graft is limited by how much peg you have to have in the native glenoid. So you have to have somewhere in the region of a centimetre or just under a centimetre in the native bone with the peg. You know, and obviously you've got to also be able to supplement that with screws. So that, that to me is your limiting factor. If you're going beyond that, it's a no-go for grafting because you're not going to have the safety um, um, there. You're going to have a high rate of failure. Can you do it as a two-stage? Yes, you can. Um, I personally try not to. I mean, I think... I would feel if I'm if I'm going if I if I felt that it was so unstable that I needed to do it as a two stage I would have I would have felt that I should have used a custom implant. Um, so it certainly wouldn't be something I aimed for. If I really ended up in there in trouble and felt that it wasn't stable and couldn't cope, then doing it as a two stage would be would be reasonable by my book. Any other comments from the other guys? Yeah, increase Yeah, regarding the ones, the, uh, the two-stage graft fixation, I think in the reverse is not really necessary because you have uh, several options for your screw direction, for your screw position, and you have with the reverse design a centripetal force uh, onto your graft. So you have perfect conditions for bone ingrowing and I personally don't see any reason why for why to go for a two um, two stage bone grafting. I have uh, perfect uh, results with the one stage. I agree with you. Okay, I, I think that that's a question that comes back to your case, uh, Mark. It's um, do you have any issues about using a lateralized glenosphere when you do a bone graft? No, not really. As you have seen in my case, I did it. I did mm -hmm. extended bone grafting. I did the lateralized glenosphere. Of course, you increase the, the force vectors, the, 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 the shift, the load of, of your, of your glenoid component is quite high. But if you have a good, good glenoid bone stock, native bone stock, I think you can, you can manage it. It's, I don't have any, I, I don't, I'm, don't, I'm not afraid of it. 
I think there's some basic rules to follow. So number one is you've got to have that peg, right? So you've got to have that. You've got to have the glenoid pointing downwards. You've got to graft it so it points inferiorly or, or straight or straight out, certainly not superiorly. Um, and, I, and personally, I think circumferential graft rather than a graft that can spit out. Um, and all that adds to um, your stability of that graft. And like Mark says, you know, we as a centre, we've not had any failures of those grafts. But I think that's because we've stuck to those rules. Um, I think if you start to deviate outside that, then you're going to get failures. Yeah. Thank you. So we will try to change gears a little bit. And the second case of uh, Jean-Christian is actually going to uh, feature some um, soft tissue management technique. Jean-Christian. OK, next slide. So that was a, a 67 years of male. He had a medical history of a diabetes and uh, some cardiac problem with a pacemaker. Unfortunately, he fell from a bike and he, uh, he suffered with an immediate pain and a loss of function. He, uh, he didn't suffer with any pain on his shoulder before uh, this injury, as what he said. So when I have seen him in clinic, he had the pain, six out of 10, and uh, very limited function with a loss of external rotation, uh, limited to minus 20 degrees, elbow at the side, and the loss of active elevation, uh, at 30 degrees only. Uh, clinically, he has a wasting on the supra and infraspinatus fossa, and I have seen him at my clinic quite quickly after, after the fall. Okay, next, please. Um, next. So when we, when we look on the uh, CT scan, we see that on the left-hand side, the supraspinatus was torn and retracted at the glenoid, and on the, on the axials, on the right-hand side, the subscapularis was torn and it was a traumatic tear of the subscapularis because you see some remnants on the lesser tuberosity. Next, please. On the MRI, uh, we can see that there was a wasting of the supraspinatus and uh, fatty infiltration, grade four of the infraspinatus. Concerning the teres minor, uh, it was totally atrophic. So this patient, um, so here is the, the, the scapula. He had a slight retroversion of eight degrees. So that was okay. And two degrees of superior tilt on the software. Okay, next. So we can choose an eight degree posterior augment base plate. All right, then, okay. So it will fit perfectly the, the slight posterior defect, playing with the depth of, uh, of the base plate. As you can see here, we can manage to have a little bit of an inferior offset in, in order to decrease even the risk of matching. And we will see that we can have 99% uh, of uh, bone to implant contact, which is not difficult to achieve with this scapula, with this glenoid. Okay, next slide. So uh, what I have done for him, what we have decided to do was to perform a straight a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And in order to restore some active external rotation, we have done in the same time a transfer of the latissimus dorsi and the teres major, as described by Pascal Boileau. We uh, release the pec major straight from the bone, and then we whip stitch it. Uh, one whip stitch at the top, one whip, whip, stitch, whip stitch, sorry, at the bottom. Then we harvest the teres major and uh, the uh, latissimus dorsi. Same thing, we stitch at the top, we stitch at the bottom. And we refix everything with two cortical buttons. So on the AP, you see the two cortical buttons to fix the transfer. And on the lateral, you see the two cortical buttons to repair 
to take major. So it's possible to do this procedure without uh, releasing the fake major. I'm not used with that, but it's possible. Okay, next slide. So here, here are the results that we have achieved. So the active elevation is not bad. I'm a little bit disappointed because you only have 140 degrees, but we have been able to restore some active external rotation. Can you, can you uh, click on the, um, so you see that it does not have any more horn blower sign. So that's a good thing. And the active external rotation elbow at the side is probably around five or 10 degrees. Next slide with the video, please. We cheated a little bit on the, on the video on the right, but on the left, on the left, you see that, ah, okay. What is able to achieve grossly five to 10 degrees of external rotation? Go, 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 go. Yeah, see? So we have five degrees. So it was minus 20. We obtained five degrees of external rotation. So the transfer usually can restore 25 degrees of external rotation. So that was the case. Now, oh, same thing. Matthew or Mark, would you have done anything differently? Would you have done straight away reverse? Would you have tried to repair the subscap in this patient? Yeah, the patient is um, 67 years old. He had, before the, the injury, no shoulder pain, no history of problems, probably also no external rotation leg sign. Um, I wouldn't have done a reverse directly. I wouldn't have gone for scoping him and to try to do at least a partial repair, probably. So you would have tried to repair the subscap? Yes. Subscap was valid. There was no real muscle atrophy. Um, interesting is what is the teres minor because the, with such an extended uh, atrophy of the teres minor, um, he must have some external rotation leg sign before the before the injury. Probably, I think it's an acute and chronic cleft tear. So yeah. This patient, this patient has a diabetes mellitus, and what I thought was, okay, if I try to scope him, I will do one surgery on him. He might fail because even though the diabetes mentis were well balanced, right, it's a risk of infection and it will fail anyway in the next years. It will need a reverse due to his cleft tear. So instead of taking the risk to repair the cuff, maybe have a cuff failure and need to, to do a, a reverse on the second uh, surgery, it would have increased the risk of infection. So that's why mm. that's why I have I have uh, I have chosen to go straight for a reverse. Mm. Okay, this is a certain philosophy. Maybe if the patient would be of an age of seventy-five years or older, I would have been the same. But in this case, with sixty-seven, this is for me too young for a direct reverse. But however, okay. I mean, you, you, it's not so much chronological age, is it? At the end of the day, if he's diabetic and poorly controlled and other disease, then that's surely going to influence your mark above just his chronological age. I mean, I, 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 I don't know. Um, it's very fancy, all that moving things around. It's not something I really have experience with. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I probably need you to teach me how to do it, JC. Um, I think if I'd have done a reverse, I would have, I would have, um, I would have just done a reverse and relied upon the deltoid to try and um, uh, to make it function. You know, um, I think in a in a good in a guy with big deltoid, you can you can still get um, external rotation even without those transfers. Um, it just worries me a little bit that the, you know you're changing the whole biomechanics of the shoulder by doing reverse, and then you're adding in another layer of biomechanical change by doing tendon transfer. Whether the brain can actually cope with that much, I, I don't. I'm not experiencing it. So I'm just a thought. Um, it's very clever what you do. It worked. I I, uh, I didn't invent it. That was my previous boss who invented it, and uh, it, it works really, really well. Really, really well. Honestly. The only thing is, when you, if you use the, the buttons to, to reattach the transfer and the fake major, the buttons need to be positioned along the, the, the long axis of the bone. It must not be transversal, because otherwise it can impede with the stem. 
Uh, this is something we need to be careful with. Uh, otherwise, the, the immobilization is just external rotation or neutral rotation uh, for four to six weeks without rehabilitation. Uh, and uh, honestly, it works very well. Yeah. And JC, do you use do you use the latissimus dorsi and the ter uh, teres major together, or sometimes only the, the latissimus? Uh, I, I, uh, I use the latissimus dorsi and the teres major. You can use only the latissimus dorsi, but then when you harvest it, you have to pass it through the teres major and turn it around. Mm -hmm. But then it, it might change the way you reattach the, the latissimus dorsi. And I don't know why, I know it works, but uh, I didn't do that so far because I'm not confident enough with the, the very thin latissimus dorsi. You know, the terrace major, it has, it had, yeah. add, sorry, adds <laughs> some thickness to the graph, yeah. but it works with the latissimus dorsi uh, alone. Like the latissimus dorsi transfer works for subscapularis not repairable. But you don't yeah. transfer the terrace major for, for non repairable. Subscribe. No, I did some cases with reverse and combined latissimus dorsi transfer, but I don't have seen that success which is reported in the literature. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really, I'm not really convinced of that. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. But probably it's the the issue of of, of Matthew said that the brain is not always able to cope to cope with that. I, I mean. Honestly, I, I wouldn't, I, I never do this surgery in an elderly patient more than 80 years old. I would say that 78 would be my maximum age, depending on the, on the shape of the patient, right? Uh, but more than 80, no. The perfect patient is honestly less than 70 with a massive cuff tear and a CTA. Mm -hmm. And a lax sign for sure. Yeah. We have a question from the audience about your case, Jean-Christian. So similar to, uh, to the earlier discussion, why did you go to reverse directly? And why did you not consider um, an arthroscopic debridement or, or and just reassess the symptoms? After that? Uh, because this guy, this patient, had a massive cuff tear, a non-repairable posterior superior cuff tear. The fatty infiltration of the infraspinatus was a stage four and no more uh, terrace minor. So that means that uh, it cannot rely on any soft tissue to maintain this humeral head at its position. So it will move up. It will move up and it will have uh, a CTA at some point. It might be in one year, two year, three years, but it will need a CTA at some point. Knowing that he has a comorbidity of the diabetes mellitus, I prefer to do one procedure, one surgery, instead of trying to repair the subscap. And I don't know if it will, it, it will um, help him in recovering an active elevation. And also, even though he can achieve a good elevation, no way he can, he can uh, recover some, ex some external rotation. And he will be unhappy because he will say, doc, I have an active elevation, but look, I cannot eat correctly. So that, that's why I prefer to do a reverse straight away with the transfer. Okay, thank you. I think we can, we can go to the next uh, case, the final one. So for dessert, we have Dr. Tauber again, showing us um, a human reconstruction in a rather young patient this time. Yeah, uh, thank you, Nicolas. Um, again, a case where we use the humor so HRP system, human reconstruction prosthesis. Um, next slide, please. The, it's a sad story, I have to admit. This, this was really a young, a young patient. You see here, it's a 25 years old uh, young guy. He had the trauma when he was on his ski holidays and he had a um, four part dislocation fracture. This was uh, in, in Austria. And he got this, um, yeah, key wire and screw fixation. And if we are honest and critical, we have to say that this first treatment, this osteosynthesis, was definitely not well done. You see, the the head is in in valgus, 
the tuberosity might be fixed. I don't know if the lesser tuberosity is in place. However, this was the post-operative result. Next slide, please. Then for follow-up, he came to me. Um, I was thinking about a revision to correct him with his osteosynthesis, but he had very soon signs of infection. Next slide, please. And he had pain and uh, within uh, six, six weeks, he developed this, this X-ray and this MRI, you see? extended infection, there was osteolysis of the, of the head. And then we, we, we removed all the, all the metal. And then you have, um, yeah, then we did a two-stage uh, procedure. We, we uh, did a cement spacer. And you see already on the CT scan that there is complete loss of the proximal humerus. You don't have the, the head, you don't have the tuberosity, so there is no metaphysis. You only have your diaphysis in this, in a 25 year old patient. So this is a real disaster. And then the question is what to do? And the only, the only solution which came in my mind was to use um, tumor reconstruction prosthesis um and we we did it you see it you see it here um next slide please these are the the, the steps so you you have to resect the part of the proximal or if the, the humeral diaphysis as well um you see here on the on the, on the right picture we came down until the until the latissimus dorsi insertion next slide please um next slide please again the, the the nice the nice design feature of this prosthesis is that you have a lateralization of your metaphysical component so you have deltoid wrapping which in my eyes is very important if you use such a, a prosthetic prosthetic replacement um next slide And yeah, this was the intraoperative um, X-ray, good position of the glenosphere and also good reconstruction of the proximal humerus. It's well fitting. Next slide. And I always, as you see, I like to, to test the intraoperative stability and the range of motion. This was my first case where I used the HRP system. It was very challenging also for me, but I was quite happy with the result. Next slide. Yeah, it's 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 sad, but it's I think the only solution for this situation. You have a young patient uh, who wants to uh, keep being active, and uh, with this extended uh, bone loss in the proximal humerus, you have to use such a such a system. So next slide. But you see the result is really, really successful. This was one year after the surgery the patient sent me this video. He was doing holidays in, in Miami. And this of course is, um, yeah, this makes me very happy. And um, I think this is the best proof that which the HRP, we can help people in this disaster situation. Yeah. He's joking, JC. I'm crazy. <laughs> yeah, what do you have another another solution for this for this case? No, I mean no. I personally do not have any experience with the HRP so far. Yeah. Uh, honestly, there's no other option. Like, yes, you could have maybe performed a massive allograft, but for what? To avoid some metal. You're 25 years old, the massive allograft, which might uh, disappear. Uh, you can have an osteolysis, then reoperation, risk of infection. No, I think this is the only the only option. Um, this this delta wing wrapping uh, does it give you uh, some internal rotation. I mean, what was the internal rotation of the patient? Because he had no more, uh, no more subscap, 
you have probably some tech major again. Yes. So, and latissimus, and latissimus dorsi. His internal rotation was L3. Oh, that's good. That's really good. Yes. And external? And extra, external rotation, he had uh, 20 degrees. So I think, I think, Mark, it's a stunning result. And um, I love that video. But the, um, I mean, I think he, he's young, isn't he? He's got a fantastic deltoid. He's going to be, he's got determination. He's the right patient. I don't think you could have done anything differently. I mean, you could have left him with no joints would be one thing. You could have done allograft. But I think in the presence of infection, that's, that's asking for trouble. Um, I think, you know, this design of this HRP without sounding like a salesman is, is, I think, a lot better than anything else on the market. And I would say that for, for a couple of reasons. One is that, so unlike the case I showed, this is a really short segment. And um, I'm assuming that you use probably the shortest one for that, um, or not much longer. Most of the other designs off the shelf require you to actually excise more humorous than you have on that patient so you just to get the smallest length in you would have had to resect more taking more muscle attachment away taking more function away and more you know normal bone that that um collar is brilliant for two reasons it allows you to absolutely centralize the stem and get a perfect cement mantle and it's got HA coating underneath it. So that in itself will bond onto, and they're different sizes. So it sits perfectly on top of the humerus. Um, and that's gonna negate a huge amount of torsional force and negate um, uh, a lot of that bending element that would occur there as well, which would potentially destroy your cement mantle. The old prosthesis that I used to use or actually continue to use until we get this in Europe properly, you know, the collar is quite small. And if that, if that doesn't sit on the bone, we get relatively high failure rates quite early. So, you know, this, the fact that you can change the size of that collar and it affects the cement mantle, I think is a huge step forward for proximal humor replacement. And I can't wait for it to be in Europe properly. Yeah. I have seen there's one question from the, from the chat. Um, if an atrodesis would have been an option for me, um, definitely not, and definitely not for the patient. Uh, the story behind this patient, this patient is young, but very successful. He is a millionaire. He is uh, involved in a couple of startups companies, and an arthrodesis wouldn't have been no option for him at all. He said clearly to me, I want to do as much as possible after this all, excuse me, the shit situation. Um, help me and i i think a lot about that case and i used the hrp system because exactly for that reason as you say matthew the special anatomic design of the proximal humerus these other systems don't have and i think the deltoid wrapping um, is important you have a lateralization even more and so the deltoid aspect the posterior one and the anterior one can help to gain more rotation in, in, in these situations. And, and as you see, it worked. Um, if we leave a little bit the HRP system, uh, can I ask you if you uh, navigate all the glenoid or do you navigate only the one that you think difficult? So for me, uh, I so I, I, we took a stance on this in Liverpool, actually. So. Um, I don't think it's logical to start to utilize something you're not used to using in the most difficult case. So on that basis, we navigate for everything. So it becomes part and parcel of your normal practice. And you're not thinking about it when you get into the most complex of cases that you're going to do. And actually, what we found is that you almost start to feel that if you don't use it, that, that you're, you're neglecting the patient in some way um, just because it comes part of your normal thing. You, do, you start to lose a little bit of, am I getting this absolutely right? So it does give you that. So we use it for every case. And uh, do you have the feeling that when you, when you watch a CT scan of your patient and you say, okay, the glenoid is A1, it's all right. And then when you, when you, uh, when you plan the case on the software, when you see that there's a retroversion, 
Yeah, so I, I said before, the number of augments that we use took a jump up with yeah. that navigation system. Now, I don't know if that's absolutely right, but I don't feel uncomfortable with it. I don't think we're harming the patients by using augments. They've got a long um, line now and we're not seeing failures with the augments. Um, so I'm, I'm happy with that. But yes, we do use more augments for sure. Yeah. The 3D reconstruction of the scapula, the glenoid really helps to, to position the base plate exactly, exactly the way we want. I mean, it's a, it's a huge advance in my hand uh, to position this glenoid the most perfectly as possible. The question, of course, is always how much of retroversion do we accept? Um, a lot of them have retroversion more than we expect, that's right. But the question, of course, is do we always have to correct it as much as possible? Sometimes I think we can really accept retroversion of, let's say, 10 degrees, even in anatomic shoulder arthroplasty, and patients are doing well, and we have a good and stable fixation of the glenoid component. I think that's probably right, Mark, but, but, but it also, it makes your operation easier. If you've got a retroverted glenoid, and once you've reamed it, you then put on a, you you normalize that version and you've got to get the glenosphere onto that base plate. It's so much easier in neutral than it is in 10 degrees of retroversion. So, you know, it actually helps you along the way, I think. Yeah, yeah. it helps you to correct, uh, especially on an anatomical uh, prosthesis in order to avoid to have 10 degrees of retroversion. Mm -hmm. uh, what I mean? So somebody was asking about the learning curve of the GPS. I mean, I don't think it takes that long. I think it's pretty easy. It probably adds, I know, 20 minutes or so to your operation at the beginning, maybe less later on. Um, it's very simple to use, particularly if the representative of the company is helping you with the case, I would say. What is difficult at the beginning is to expose uh, correctly uh, the coracoid process, the basis of the coracoid process. Uh, but what, once we are used to that, then it, it's pretty quick. Maybe at the end, once you have done, I don't know, at less than 10, it might add 10 minutes to your procedure. Not more, I think, really. Yeah. I think it forces you to improve your exposure in some ways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially inferiorly. Yeah. We have one last question, just going back to the case, uh, Mark. The uh, question from the audience is, uh, will you advise your patient not to go skiing again, or do you just know that he won't listen to you? Um, he, was skiing, he was skiing again, I know that. Um, of course, this is his risk, um, but he's a very clever and intelligent guy, so he will know. Michael Schumacher was too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we can move on. I wanted to thank you all three very much for all those cases tonight. I think that they were really interesting. Uh, I want to thank the attendees for staying up uh, with us. Uh, we are a little bit uh, above the time that we anticipated. Um, thank you, Nelly. Thank you, Alyssa, for all the background work uh, that went into uh, organizing this webinar. Um, I hope this was interesting for everybody. Um, please let us know how we did, how, how uh, you liked it. There will be um, a survey linked to the email that you will receive um, that will um, give you the recording of that webinar. It's only a three question survey, so please, uh, please uh, try to answer it. Save the date for the next webinars that we will organize. We will have one about the Vantage Total Ankle on the March 25th. And then the next shoulder webinar, I, I hope that all of you will join us again on April 15 about advanced technologies in shoulder arthroplasty. Next one. If you have any difficult cases that you would like to share with us, feel free to send them to Nelly. And uh, we will try to send them to our panel for uh, getting, giving, uh, getting the advice. 
And at this point, I think we can adjourn. Thank you very much. And I wish you a great evening. Thank you.